Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 398 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by former heavyweight world title challenger, the pride of Pittsburgh, PA, Fast Eddie <laughs> Chambers. Go on, Eddie. <laughs> Damn, man, that was pretty good, Joe. Hey, hey maybe we need to get you to actually do that. Yeah. <laughs> How are nah, you, but I'm man? good, How man. How about you? you? I'm good, man. I'm good. How about you? How you feeling this week? I'm doing well, my friend. Saying Eddie for so long took all the breath out of me to ask how you were. So uh, I apologize about that. <laughs> That's all right, man. I, I appreciate what you did, man. <laughs> all right, my man. Anyway, let's roll straight through with the review part of the show. We're going to start here at the Helios Arena in Germany over here. Um, a guy that me and Eddie used to laugh at, like I say, a guy called Daniel Diets, who almost weighs 300 pounds. We have to stop laughing because he's now 10-0 and with 10 KOs, a first-round knockout again for him here against Enes Kermizitoprak, who's now 12-4. and Forget about that guy. It's all about the Diets. Um, yeah, brilliant. Um, elsewhere on the card, former world champion Tyrone Zoiga. It's his second comeback um, fight here. He is now 26-1 and with a draw. Still has that sole defeat to Rocky Fielding. A unanimous decision over six rounds against Andre Budera. Now 18-31 and with two draws. And the top of the bill, the main man himself. I usually like to say... Um, you know, I like to say that the, the venue, and I say it's usually the the um, Firat Arslan Sports Hall, and I like to say who's promoting the show, Eddie, who's who's fighting in the main event. But sadly, this one wasn't in his own arena. But anyways, Firat Arslan, fifty three years of age, now fifty four and nine with three draws, a knockout in the first round against Ibrahim Yildirim, who's now eleven and four, another. Knockout win for Arslan. No sign of him slowing down. Moving out now to the Tupatimi Air Force Central Stadium in Bangkok, Thailand. Over here, Wisaksa Wangek, a.k.a. Sarisaket Sorungvasai, Eddie, a.k.a. Let's see if you've been listening. A.k.a. Oh, the rodent eater. Oh, there we go. yeah. There we go, my man. Uh, never mind. I don't even want to remember that. <laughs> 52 and 6 with a draw these days. Um, he might celebrate maybe with with uh, with with a different type of rodent, perhaps. Um, how about just a cake? How about that? Why don't we put it out there? Just eat a cake, something actually edible. I well, I mean, I guess that's edible too. But Jesus, never mind. Never mind. Just suggest a cake, Joe, please. Yeah, I would much prefer to see him eat a cake, but sadly, that's not how he gets down, Eddie. And uh, maybe it's, listen, maybe it's part of it, you know. We've seen Juan Manuel Marquez drink his own urine. Uh, maybe, you know, there's there's power behind that. No one, no one wants to give that a go, but maybe there's some power behind eating rodents. And I would like to see him go for something a bit bigger, because that rat that he did... Um, have a picture with was only about the size of his whole face Um, obviously rodents you know the the biggest rodent in the world being a capybara that would be quite interesting I wouldn't put it past him Um, 
yeah, so he was able to unanimously beat over eight rounds. Comgrich Nantapetch, who's now 31 and 7. You love the Thai accent there. Um, it doesn't really dwindle much from my original one. Anyway, moving now to a bigger card that took place at the Vitality Stadium in Bournemouth, Dorset, United Kingdom. It was live on Sky Sports. Let's start with the undercard. Mace Rug, or I think it's Rueg. He's now 9-0. and It was very predictable. A points win over four rounds against Dean Dodge, who's now 9-4 and with a draw. I believe this fight got cut down to four rounds from six rounds because, uh, yeah, it ended up being the very final fight on the card because um, they didn't get a chance to throw it in any earlier. And, yeah, it was untelevised. It ended up taking place after the main event when there was barely any anyone left in the in the stadium. Um, and yeah, so once again, I should also mention that Isaac Chamberlain's fight got cancelled altogether. He actually didn't end up fighting, even though he was there ready, you know, with his opponent. He'd made weight, and yeah, that was quite a shame for him. So yeah, Mace Rueg now 9-0, and like I say, expected there. Um, elsewhere on the card, Tommy Welch now 11-0, and a points win for him over six rounds against Amin Bouchetta, who's now 7-7. Seven and seven. Um, Tommy Welch, like I say, with a points win over six, now eleven, uh, now eleven and zero. Um, he started to get to Bachetta, I think, in the in like the fifth and sixth rounds. So it would have been interesting if perhaps that was a couple rounds longer. Um, elsewhere on the card as well, friend of the show, Mikey McKinson, now twenty five and one, a knockout in round seven, a TKO against Lebin Morales, now nineteen and seven with a draw. Morales down in the very first round. Um, Obviously, this isn't a guy who, you know, should give McKinson any problems. But the way McKinson was breaking him down, man, McKinson, as I've said so many times, is such a talented fighter. And the only thing lacking is his power, which is crazy because he's now put together two knockouts in a row, which is just, I think, got to be the longest run of knockouts he's put together before. Um, He's just not known as a banger at all, you know, and that's like the one thing that's missing from his game. But yeah, he's starting to show that power. It seems like maybe uh, ever since he lost to Virgil Ortiz, maybe Ortiz gave him some some little tips in the dressing room after their fight. Who knows? Um, But yeah, he's got four KOs now to his name in his 25 wins. All the best to him. Two KOs in a row. (laughs) Go on, the McKinson. Um, Really, really like him as well. Like I say, but I tell you what, what a talent, man. I've said it. I said it from early, early, early on before he wasn't even boxing on, you know, TV cards. He is such a talent and a complete nightmare for anybody. Um... Yeah, so brilliant performance from him once again. Moving up the card, Karis Artingstall now 4-0. and Once again, a predictable points win for her over eight twos against Jade Taylor, who loses her row. She's now 5-1. and one. Um, I'm going to talk about this as well. This is probably the, the best fight. Or I shouldn't, shouldn't say the best fight. I should say the, the best performance of the weekend. Oh, actually, I'm not even sure I'd say that because, you know, the main event for one particular fighter was fantastic. But anyway, a massive shout out to Sam Eggington, man. A massive shout out to him. He upsets the odds once again. He's now 34-8, and a TKO in round five against the previously undefeated Joe Pigford, who was 20-0 and with 19 KOs. He was the betting favorite, even though he hadn't boxed anyone at Sam Eggington's level. And I tell you what, Sam Eggington was fantastic, and I'm a big fan of Sam's, and if you know his story, you can't not be a fan of his, you know, I've always liked Sam, he's been on the show before, Um, obviously when he boxed Carlos Molina back in 2021, I was in the opposing corner, uh, because Carlos is a good friend of mine, obviously. Um, a really good friend, and, you know, for that night there, that was like the only fight I ever wanted him to lose, and he boxed fantastic that night, it was great to be up there in Coventry for it, but, you know, i got to say, even though Sam's always in a great fight, and he always brings it, always brings it 100%, and the rest of it, and he's never in a boring fight, um, I was very concerned after watching him fight Dennis Hogan. Dennis Hogan, I didn't think was a great fighter. We'll be speaking about him a little bit later, by the way. And um, Dennis Hogan, I thought, made beating Sam Eggington look quite easy. He just used his feet, and I thought to myself, maybe Eggington is really, you know, um, towards the end of his career. Because, you know, after that Carlos Molina fight, he had a great fight with Belel Jikatu, who was undefeated, by the way, but they had a real, real hard war. And obviously... Um 
that puts miles on the clock and then he had the fight with that pole um prisms prism slaw zisk or something he was undefeated as well that was a real war again and um yeah you know he, he's been in a few wars and he didn't look good against dennis hogan and then he had the one comeback fight on a dinner show in canuck and then that wasn't a real proper fight and then he gets in with joe pigford who like i say was the rightful betting favorite because if you follow the track record there you're saying okay sam hasn't looked good he's been in wars he can't really afford to get in a war with this guy who can bang if this power is real and we were going to find out so much about pigford and yeah unfortunately for pigford I don't know where he goes from here, because losing to Sam Eggington at this point isn't a great look. But like I say, Sam Eggington deserves all the credit in the world, man. Probably one of the best performances he's ever put in. And like I say, I really did think he was close to the end watching that Dennis Hogan fight. What a way to come back. He didn't lose a second of any round, and then the way he got Pigford out of there, the referee was a little bit slow to jump in, but what a performance from Eggington. And I think off the back of that, he deserves a massive fight. So, over the moon for him. Still young, I think he's about the same age as me. And um, yeah, all the best to Sam Eggington, man. I've been on that train a long, long time, and long may it continue if he's happy and if he's safe. Uh, moving to the main event now this one really was super disappointing Lawrence Acoli now 19 and 1 he loses his O a majority that's questionable majority decision over 12 rounds to Chris Billum Smith 18 and 1 who is now the new WBO cruiserweight world champion Lawrence Acoli down in round 4 down in round 10 down in round 11 had a point deducted in round 5 and round 7 Wow, it was just such a shock, and I gotta be honest, I, I, with with the rest of my predictions on the weekend of boxing, I pretty much got absolutely everything a hundred percent bang on, and then yeah, Lawrence Sokoli does that and ruins everything. Um, I just, I just could not believe it. But yeah, the first knockdown, Akoli was caught with that left hook while, while kind of having his jab hand extended out. His legs were all over the place when he did get back up. But I was really impressed because he did get back up on really, really shaky legs, and he made Chris Willem Smith miss a lot after that. And he was grabbing hold of him. It was really, really smart from Akoli. He was weathering that storm really well. Um, yeah, like I say, had a point off for persistent holding. And yeah, I just thought to myself, a Coley is fighting like the older Coley, you know. I thought he was winning the rounds when they were uneventful, but he was in a bit of trouble in the rounds that were eventful. Um, obviously, again, the fight was in Bournemouth. Every time that, you know, Chris would throw a decent shot, the crowd would go wild. And, um, you know, he, he'd been knocked down a Coley, he had a point took off. And then obviously gets knocked down again, gets another point to, took off, gets knocked down again. Um, you know, I thought that maybe at least one of the three knockdowns were not proper knockdowns, you know, maybe even two of the three. I think the first one was clearly a knockdown, but the, the second and the third I wasn't 100% sure on. Uh, it was kind of hard to see. There was a lot of like he was being hit and then holding on and then falling to the floor. And it, it was hard to see if that really should have been a knockdown and stuff like that. Um, a lot of, like I say, a lot of um, tangling of legs because Akoli's so gangly and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was close to getting disqualified. And I just I just couldn't understand it as well. Like, Akoli would come out and... We're talking like round eight, round nine, you know. Mathematically, it was getting impossible for him to win on points, if not already way impossible a few rounds before. But he wasn't coming out with much desperation. He was coming out and, again, attempting to hold and hold and hold. And the referee is, again, close to disqualifying him, yet he's coming out and holding and holding and holding again. He needed space to be able to land the shots. He needed to land. He needed a knockout. He shouldn't be trying to hold. He should be trying to do anything but hold. So it was just such a strange performance. It was like, you know, the older Coley that used to do the holding all the time. But the thing is, you can't hold in a fight where you're losing badly on the scorecards you can't keep holding you know so it was one of the most bizarre you know bunch of tactics i've seen in a world title fight and also i'm not a massive fan of the fighter 
in Chris Billum Smith and the corner in Shane McGuigan trying hard to influence the referee to take points off and stuff like that. But again, at the same time, I was thinking, what on earth is Akoli doing? He is literally playing into their hands. Every single time he'd hold, Chris Billum Smith would look at the referee and, you know, be shaking his head and the crowd would be booing. And like I say, Shane McGuigan, I think, was making noise in the corner. But he didn't help himself, Akoli. He kept holding and holding and holding. And it was just so baffling um you know every time Akoli did have space he landed a big shot he landed a clean shot but he just wanted to smother his own work again and again and again and again and yeah like <laughs> I just I just couldn't get my head around it but yeah um I I don't want to take much away from Chris Willem Smith I'm a fan of his I think he's a really nice guy um but, yeah, I think it had a lot to do with Akoli's poor performance rather than Chris Billum smiths good one. Even though Chris Billum smith showed that he can really cope under pressure. And, you know, he, he, he thrived under pressure, actually. And also, he's got a fantastic chin as well. He took some big shots, hung in there. He fought brilliantly. But I think it was a lot to do with how poor Akoli was. And I also feel like the... The referee was was not really doing a Coley many favors. I think he was he was doing a lot of favors for um for for Chris Billum Smith. Um, but yeah, you know, I do want to give credit to Shane McGuigan as well. How cool must he feel? You know, I, I mentioned that he was making noise in the corner trying to influence the referee, but obviously a Coley left Shane McGuigan, and their partnership looked like it was made to be it was it was it was they were made for each other and then he decided to leave Shane McGuigan on good terms they didn't have a a bad break they left on you know amicable terms but here we go he goes in against his old gym mate and he loses in that fashion you know loses his world title loses his O and puts in the worst performance of his career so Shane McGuigan must be feeling cool and um, it was good sportsmanship as well for McCauley at the end. I liked that. They are friends. And, um, yeah, we're going to see the rematch, but no one really wants to see it. And, again, Eddie Hearn, I'm sure, will be quite happy because he's now done with McCauley. And every fighter that's left him to go and fight on Sky Sports has looked awful. And McCauley's just the latest on that um, on that, on that that um, little list, I guess. Obviously, Josh Boazzi as well. They've looked awful since they've gone back to Sky. And moving now to the Manchester Arena, this one was live on the zone. Uh, let's start with this undercard. Campbell Hatton now 12 and 0, a TKO for him in round five against Michael Bullock, who's now six and three. The first time he's been stopped as well there, Bullock. Um, we had the debut as well of former world champion Anthony Crawler. His his younger brother William Crawler made his pro debut. He was down in round three. Um, not sure if it was a slip, but anyway, it was a four rounder, so it was a bit kind of um I think nervy when it came to the scorecards but anyway he got the win he's 1 and 0 he got the points win against Joe Hardy who's now 2 and 10 also on the card Akib Fiaz he won and super narrowly by the skin of his teeth he was down in round 6 um and yeah he managed to scrape a points win there I think just by about 1 point I believe it was he was able to Remain undefeated, 12-0, and 0, a points win over eight against Costin Ion, who's now 10-4 and 4 with two draws. Um, again, that one could have gone either way. He has really been um, a bit of a slow burner, Akib Fiaz. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure um, how far he's going to go based on what he's looked like thus far as a pro. Um, elsewhere on the card, Danny Ball moved to 13-1 and one with a draw. Um, really good win for him, actually. Um, he was able to beat Jamie Robinson, who's now 15-6 and six with two draws, an eighth round um, yeah, retirement. Jamie Robinson didn't come out for round nine. Um, yeah, and he was also down in round two, Robinson. So Danny Ball, I expected him to win that one on points, or at least just a fight to go to points. But I was quite surprised when he actually managed to get the stoppage. Jamie Robinson never been stopped before, been stopped for the first time there. Terry Harper, still the WBA World Super Welterweight Champion. She was able to extend her wins to 14 wins with a, uh, a loss and a draw. Um, a unanimous decision over 10 two-minute rounds against Ivana Habazin, now 21-5. and five. Um, Habazin only given six days' notice. She flew from Florida to, uh, to Manchester. 
and put in a really good performance actually it was super super close the scorecards didn't show that unfortunately and that was no real surprise i thought if it goes the distance terry's going to get the you know going to get all the close rounds and stuff like that but habazin won a bunch of rounds and kept catching terry harper with the overhand right uh, maybe if Habazin had a bit more notice, she could have definitely done something more there. But Terry Harper, not a great look for her. But then again, also, you know, I don't want to take too much away from her. She also only had six days notice for the fight. She was obviously going to be fighting last week. And she made weight and everything. And um, her opponent pulled out on the day of the fight. So she had to wait a week. I guess that's probably messed around with the time that you'd peak and stuff like that. Especially when you're getting down... And making the weight, having to make the weight, you know, twice in um in 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 one week is a bit crazy. So um yeah, you know, don't take too much away from her. Credit to her still, even though I don't really like her trainer. Moving up the card once again, we'll be speaking to him in a few moments. Jack Catterall, now twenty seven and one, a unanimous decision over ten rounds against Dara Foley, who's now twenty two and five with a draw. It was for the vacant WBA Intercontinental Super Lightweight title. Dara Foley down once in round 7 and once in round 9. Catterall deducted a point in round 7 for hitting Foley whilst he was down. He completely dominated the fight, Jack Catterall. Dara Foley's got a bit of a nickname for kind of being in exciting fights all the time, but it wasn't that exciting because Jack Catterall was in full control from the bits I did see of the fight. Um, it was obviously very hard kind of, you know, watching one on TV, one on an iPad and one on the phone all at the same time. I didn't watch anything back, so I was kind of a little bit split between different fights at the same time. So what I did see, it looked like Jack Cattle was in full control and um, yeah, I expected him to win on points. But at times it looked like he was going to be able to step step on the gas maybe and get Foley out of there. But Foley still never been stopped and um, yeah, credit to him. Very tough guy, always comes and gives it his all. And in the main event, Maurizio Lara, he has been dethroned. He's now 26 and 3 with a draw. He loses his WBA World Featherweight title on the scows. Um, basically, he came in for a check weight and he wasn't on the check weight or nowhere near it. So the British Boxing Board of Control decided to make a decision to basically say they weren't going to allow him to even attempt to make the weight. So he was denied an opportunity of actually making the weight. They said it would be too unsafe. So for that reason, he didn't even get a chance to attempt to weigh 126. He loses his title on the scales. Um, he was down in the second round. Um, and yeah, he lost a unanimous decision over 12. I said it on last week's show. I didn't really think we'd see the fight go to distance, and we did. So I was wrong. On, I was wrong on that one there. But Lee Wood with the win, 27 and three, really over the moon for him. Like I say, because um, you know he got knocked out brutally. Well, I say brutally. The towel come in, but he got hurt badly in in the first fight. We've seen what Lara can do at this level. And um, yeah, credit to Ben. Ben um, Ben Davison as well in the corner, you know, for um, taking Lee Wood away, obviously working with him again, you know, and, and, and coming back with probably quite a similar game plan, really, because, you know, Lee Wood was boxing really well in that first fight, but obviously he was able to sharpen a few things, and he looked really, really good, Lee Wood. He's now the two-time champion of the world, and he's beaten a guy that's beaten him, so credit to him. Obviously, that's probably going to be the end of Maurizio Lara at this level for a little while. Who wants to go near that danger, man? But, um, yeah, Lee Wood, like I say, please for him, and, um, yeah, Credit to him and Ben, man. Um, good, good, good team. I think Ben has made Lee really improve as a fighter under him. And um, yeah, I mean, who'd have thought he'd be a two-time world champion? Certainly not me. Certainly not many, many other people. And a lot of people thought he'd get knocked out again. So he was able to upset the odds. And yeah, brilliant for him, man. Really happy for him. Seems like a nice guy. And yeah, new new WBA world featherweight champion again. Um... They're talking about him and Josh Warrington. That's a good fight, I think. There's a lot of decent fights that can be made. And thankfully, there's enough um, featherweights in the UK for, you know, a big domestic showdown. So, yeah, all the best to Lee Wood going forward. And, yeah, excellent, excellent. 
Uh, moving now to this one, it took place at the SSE Arena in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Over here, let's run through this undercard real quick. Um, Pierce O'Leary now 12 0, a TKO in round one against Alin Siocheri, um, who's now 17 and 4. Pierce O'Leary, like I say, 12 0, first round there. Um, left hook it was, I think, that ended it, and it was for the WBC International Super Lightweight title. Also on the on the card as well, Podrig McCrory, now 17-0, and a points win for him over 10 against Diego Ramirez, who's now 25-10 and 10 with a draw. Um, most people thought McCrory would get the knockout there, but he didn't. That went 10. Um, Anthony Kakachi now 21-1, and one, a unanimous decision for him over 12 rounds against Damian Rosinski, who's now 26-3 and three with two draws. Um, it was for the IBO World Super Featherweight title. Anthony Kakachi, um, it was more like a sparring session for me. Um, you know, I think he's a good fighter. He's got a lot of skills, obviously, Kakachi, but... <sighs> I don't know, there's something that, for me, is missing. And he, he's barely ever in an exciting fight, you know? Um, that's no knock on him. Like I say, some of the most skilled fighters in the world are so skilled that they're barely ever in a really, really, you know, barn burner of a fight because they, they, they perfect those skills that they have. But, yeah, um, I mean, this is a guy who's right up there in the world rankings, who is, you know, right up there... And and perhaps closing in on a world title shot, but I mean, there's not the push. There's not the push behind him. There's not the fan base behind him. I don't think because he just doesn't bring that excitement. And you know, like I said, there's something missing there. You know, I don't think we're going to see many people staying up to watch him if he box for a world title in America at 4 a.m. You're going to get no viewers. It's just I don't know. I mean, like I say, no knock to to the guy's talent, but um. He's getting up there in age as well, and I think it's kind of now or never. He's not He's not a guy who's going to get two or three world title shots. I think he's going to get one, and that's going to be that. So he's going to try to take that with both hands. He's calling out the champions and stuff. But again, I just don't really know what he brings to the table. So I'm not sure how easy it's going to be getting one of these champions to fight him because he's a good fighter. But, you know, no fan base, no real big money, I don't think, behind him. Not a massive ticket seller as far as I'm aware. And I could be wrong about that. But anyway, moving on, moving on. Uh, Nick Ball now 18-0, and 0, a TKO in the 12th and final round against Ladumo Lamarti, who's now 21-1 and 1 with a draw. The South African loses his O. It was for the WBC silver featherweight title. Lamarti's corner through the towel in. And it's mad, Eddie, because I doubt you saw it, but Nick Ball is this little featherweight who's about five foot two, who's got dynamite in both hands, and he fights like a Mexican. He fought an undefeated fighter here in Ladumo Lamarti. And because Lamarti's towel, uh, sorry, because Lamarti's corner threw the towel in with about 30 seconds to go in the 12th round, straight away people were on Twitter, as, as I'm sure you're going to not be surprised to hear, saying, why would you throw the towel in in the last round with 30 seconds to go? What the hell? They could have just let him go the distance. Well, Eddie, I think those people were probably quite quick to delete their tweets when after the fight, Lamarty standing there in the corner, then collapses and ends up being took out the ring on a stretcher, thankfully with oxygen. Um, so yeah, ready. Um, no surprise from the Twitter brigade jumping on a, a, an early stoppage or a, or a corner doing the wrong thing. It just goes to show that these corners know their men better than these people do on Twitter. That's a fact. That's a fact. I actually saw parts of it. I saw the end of it when uh, you know, and they bought and it, and it reminded me because he fought Isaac Glow, my man from uh, from over there in the UK, and 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 he and I, you know, I would have thought Isaac would have been able to hit man. That little guy is, is rough. He's he, he's coming to fight every fight, and like you said, he does have dynamite in both hands, speed, pretty skilled. He's not bad at all. He's a he's a he's a, he's a, he's a tough out for anybody right now. But um, uh, Eddie, yeah, Eddie, 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 you're I, talking about the wrong guy. Which one? You said the small guy, right? He fought Isaac, right? Isaac No, Lowe. no, 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 no. Oh shit! Guy? Yeah, you are. You are. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Nick, what, Nick Ball. I'm Nick like, Ball. Huh? Sorry, like sorry, I know I'm crazy. Sorry, sorry. I was laughing. I ain't crazy. I, I thought you were no, talking about the, the guy in the main event, Luis Lopez, who beat Michael Conlon. He also fought Isaac Lowe. 
Okay, sorry. No, 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 no. I, I remember Nick. I remember Nick, this guy. I remember him, and then I seen him in the fight, and I was like, "Oh wow, he's fighting." And I seen him, and it was in the same situation. He was putting his hands on him in, in a crazy way, especially at the end, and it looked like. And it, I, I didn't realize that it was like I, I didn't. I don't know if I was paying attention or if I was watching the fight fully, but I. But it was like the last thirty seconds of the fight where he was getting where he ended up getting stopped, and it's like, damn. But just like you said, brave. Brave corners, not necessarily brave corners in this situation, but the brave crowd watching the fight. Oh, you could have let him go to distance. Oh, you could have fought a few more seconds. Hey, you could have fought a few more seconds. You say that, but you don't see his eyes in the corner. You don't see him closely. You don't know him like the like his corner does, like his people, like who he, he most likely in cases who, he, who he's come up with, who he's trained with. Um, so in those situations, it's kind of hard to say, hey, you know, oh, don't stop the fight. You'll never hear me say that. You'll never hear me get mad about a guy uh, uh, like a corner coming up, stopping the fight at any point because you just don't know what's going on. You're not there physically, so it's hard to tell. But, yeah, and, and look, he collapses. You know, it could have been even more serious. I mean, I don't know the, I don't know what's going on with him now. Uh, maybe we should find out. But uh, at, at the end of the day, man, you know, this sport is dangerous. You know what I mean? You can, you can say what you want to say about these guys stopping fights early or whatever, but I'd rather be earlier. Too early, but too late. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And the latest I've heard is that, um, yeah, he is, um, you know, continuing to to improve in his health, but he is still in the hospital as we speak, as far as I'm aware. So prayers with Ladumo Lamarty. Um, yeah, you know, like I say, um, thank God that the corner did throw the towel in because they may have saved his life actually so um it just makes me laugh some of the people calling you know for the you know for the towel to have not come in i'm sure those tweets have been deleted i'm not going to say who tweeted it but a big page on twitter did tweet it and instantly i thought oh i'm not so sure i saw something that didn't make me feel too great and then when i seen him um you know collapse i thought okay i hope that tweet's been deleted now because it, it is insensitive um yeah, moving up to the main event on that card as well. Another guy who boxed Isaac Lowe in the past, Luis Alberto Lopez, now 28-2. and two. It was his 30th pro fight. He was able to successfully defend his IBF World Featherweight title. I thought he'd knock out Michael Conlon. He did. He knocked him out in round five. Michael Conlon now 18-2. and two. A lot of people, I, I really don't understand where the confidence came from, but a lot of people were absolutely adamant that Michael Conlon would win this fight on points. I was not one of them. I didn't understand how they were so confident. Michael Conlon got knocked out by Lee Wood, and I said it on last week's show. If Lee Wood can, do can knock him out, Lopez can knock him out, and that is exactly what happened. I think the first couple rounds, Conlon boxed okay, and then, you know, I just thought it's only a matter of time till he gets caught. And he did get caught, and it was no surprise at all. And yeah, it was a great, a great um, shot. That right uppercut as well, perfect, right on the chin from Lopez. The corner threw the towel in, and yeah, um, it's heartbreak for Conlon. And I did say that it's now or never. I don't know if he's going to be getting another shot. We'll have to wait and see. Um, I'm sure he'd like to obviously try again. But yeah, Jamie Conlon had quite a short career you know box for a world title and then didn't hang around for too long I don't know if Conlon is gonna be the same and maybe retire you know after only a small amount of fights I think his style is still very amateur like and I just don't think he's adapted that well to the pros and I keep going back to it when he turned over he turned over at the same time as Shakur Stevenson Stevenson and him they were talking about those two fighting down the line look where Stevenson is now and look where Michael Conlon is it's it's just worlds apart and yeah Michael Conlon has has really struggled i think to adapt as a pro that's my opinion and um, it's, it's another heartbreak for Irish boxing. Irish boxing at the moment is in a terrible place. Katie Taylor losing, Gary Cully losing. Um, yeah, it's, it's in a bad place. And yeah, moving now to the final card to mention. It took place at the Fantasy Springs Casino in Indio, California, USA. It was on the zone as well. Oscar De La Hoya, Golden Boy Promotions. One fight to mention. The main event, I didn't see it, but the result was Alexis Rocha with a knockout in round five. He's now 23 and 1, a KO against Anthony Young, who's now 24 and 3. So that one was for the 
uh, for the WBO, NABO welterweight title. All the best there to Alexis Rocha. I thought he'd win that one quite easily, and he did. So that is that. That brings the review part to a close. The final thing for me to do in this part is to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a man who on paper goes down as a former super lightweight world title challenger, but I think he deserves to be announced, in my opinion, as the uncrowned and undefeated, undisputed super lightweight world champion. It is, of course, Mr. Jack Catterall. Jack, welcome back on the show, my man. Thank you, Joey. How are we keeping? Not too bad, my friend. How are you? Yeah, all good. Thank you. Nice. Uh, but we're on now Wednesday, so a couple of days since the fight on Saturday, just had few days at home, let my body recover, spent some time with the family, but I'm in good spirits. Excellent stuff, my man. So, Jack, we last spoke back in uh, September of 2021. At that time, you were getting ready to fight Josh Taylor. I think the fight originally was scheduled for December 18th. Obviously, it ended up taking place in February um, of, of 2022. I know it's obviously a while ago now, but we haven't spoken since. Uh, if you can, Jack, just, just talk me through what you remember of the fight. And obviously, I just wanted to ask as well how you feel about it now over a year on. Yeah, so uh, we had a great preparation for the fight. Uh, enjoyed the build-up to it. Uh, we had a great week in Scotland in the build-up to the fight, and I felt the fight, uh, I boxed out. I wanted to box in that fight. I uh, felt I controlled the pace, the distance, uh, shut all his attacks down, and and I think, I think I've think i breezed through the fight quite comfortably. Uh, adding down once. Looking back, maybe I could have capitalised on that a bit more. Uh, but I felt I, I won the fight uh, quite handily. Uh, obviously, we know what went on with the scorecards that night. And uh, I think in the immediate aftermath, there was a period maybe of about a week or two where I was bummed out about it. But ultimately, I knew, uh, although there was a lot of uh, uproar and media attention on it, you kind of have to swallow it and accept that nothing is going to be done about it. And uh, if I'm to, to carry on boxing as a career, that I'd have to pick myself up and uh, move forward. So, uh, But then after that, it was quite a funny period of time for me in my career where uh, promoter contracts, uh, fights, the, the rematch falling through, other fights falling through. So you're going through a time period of 15 months where uh, you kind of close the book on it. Uh, so much rumours and dates scheduled for the rematch. Ultimately, that didn't happen immediately. Uh, and then, yeah, it's, it, 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 I want to say it was a difficult time. I think the few weeks after the fight were difficult, but I kind of knew I had to regroup and uh, get my stuff together and get back on the charge for them world titles. Uh, and ultimately, we uh, we got back in the picture on Saturday. And Jack, I appreciate you summing that up, but obviously it's so much easier to you know to say than do and obviously you would have you would have had to go through that it kind of made me feel a little bit like i remember when tyson fury returned against um deontay wilder obviously you know he'd, he'd spent that time out of the ring and a lot of people felt he just put in the performance of his career to to do that to wilder in the first fight and he was only given the draw and you kind of thought how on earth do you dust yourself back down go back to the gym again and come back and win again like you've boxed out your skin and i think a lot of people probably thought that in 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 the josh taylor fight maybe that's the best performance we'd ever seen from you how on earth can you go back and go that's fine i'm gonna swallow that and come back and and, and continue to improve on it it's so difficult but like i said it was great to see you back in the ring on Saturday um, I did want to say as well you know a lot of Scottish boxing fans I think I'm going to say it now very very biased to Josh Taylor but even the most biased of Scottish Taylor fans had to admit he did not win that fight I saw a lot of that on the night yeah of course I mean going back to what you just said a minute ago uh, I enjoy boxing and, and I'm passionate about it and I've and I've said it before and I'll say it again, I do believe the best years are ahead of me. Uh, people might have pipped and said that uh, it was an out of skin performance and I might, may not be able to perform at that level again, but uh, I'm in the gym constantly sparring. I feel like I'm only getting better, so to be kept out of the ring through no fault of my own, it's, it's been frustrating, but... Oh, I'm losing you a bit, Jack. How I feel I can perform and... and 
Oh, sorry, Joey, can you hear me? I lost you for about five seconds there. Sorry, man. Have you got... You're back now, you're back now. Yeah, that's fine. So, yeah, I just want to kick on now and get active and and keep performing and, and get back to them world title fights and show that I do belong at that top level in boxing. Yeah, and like I say, not to dwell too much on the past, but yeah, I remember after the fight, I kind of spent a lot of time thinking about what could be done by the sanctioning bodies to make it up to you, and you know, there really was nothing. I mean, it was just, nothing's going to bring back that moment unless we get a time machine out. Um, I was certain that we'd see Josh Taylor move to 147, and he could quite easily say it was the weight that, that made him look real bad there, but yeah, I just can't believe that, you know, a year on, he's still at the weight, and we're not seeing him in with you, it's just crazy, but yeah, let's let's move on, like I say, let's discuss your fight over the weekend, Jack, you return finally to brush off those cobwebs, 15 months of them, um, yeah, you return with a dominant performance over 10 rounds against the very tough Dara Foley. Just walk me through the fight and also how it felt as well to actually finally get back in the ring, like you said. Yeah, there was a mix of emotions on Saturday. Uh, a lot of relief. Uh, long, long preparation for this fight. I had to be careful that I didn't uh, didn't peak too soon. I mean, we, we've had three fights scheduled in that, in that 15 months, so I've been in the gym working, peaking, coming back down and uh we we got the deal done with match room and quite quite soon after that they they give us a date against Foley so that was exciting. Uh and, and I enjoyed the whole experience of it being with a new uh, promotional company, the fight week build up, uh the fight being in my hometown so to speak. Uh it was good and you know what, I had tremendous support Saturday and uh really grateful for that. A lot of people turned out and it felt like Although we had uh, Wood as the main event, it felt like everybody was there for me on Saturday. So it was uh, it was nice. And uh, yeah, 15 months being in the dressing room, lacing up the boots and, and putting the small gloves on, uh, it, it, it excited me. And I knew that I had to put on a good performance Saturday. And I, I put that pressure on myself because uh, 15 months out of the ring, and we're talking about a fighter in Foley that's, that's had the activity, he's had the momentum, he's coming off his career best win only a matter of 10, 12 weeks ago. And he got the same notice for the fight that I did. That fight had been had been proposed to him quite immediately. So I knew he was going to come, he was going to be fit, prepared. Uh, so I knew I had to be on my air game on Saturday. And Jack, obviously it's very soon after the fight, um, but do you have a plan of what you want to do next, maybe when you want to box again? Yeah, I think activity is going to be key for me now. Uh, I don't really want to be sitting about waiting six, nine months between fights. Uh, certainly not 15 months. But uh, I'm hopeful. There's already been dates looming of uh, September, October dates. Uh, that would fit well for me. And I want to I want to get involved now. I mean, Taylor's still got one of the titles. Like you just said, he's still at 140, so... If he gets through Lopez, maybe that's a potential fight. But uh, a fight that I'm really interested in is the Regis Progre fight. We know he fights in uh, in two and a half weeks' time, so I'll be keeping a close eye on that one. But that's a fight that I would definitely like to get involved in. And I remember you calling out Regis, um, you know, quite soon after the um, after the Taylor fight. If I'm not mistaken, I think you even called him out before he had a belt. Um, you know, Regis is a friend of the show. He's, he's a friend of mine. He was on the podcast last week, actually. But um, when you called out his name initially, I was like, I don't want to see that fight. I might be unpopular, in my opinion. But my reason is, if anyone deserves an easy route to a world title, it's you. And everyone knows that. I think Regis is obviously a tough fight. I'm not saying you'd lose, but I'm saying it's a tough fight. That's a, that's a hard fight. I don't feel like you need or deserve to go through a hard fight necessarily because he could potentially be, you know, <clears throat> excuse me there, um, one one or two in the division. You know, this, this is a real good fighter who, in his one loss, again, like yourself, narrowly lost to, to Taylor on points. Yeah, of course, and I, and I appreciate and understand what, what you mean by that. But I think on the flip side, we, we were talking about Regis. He's got the WBC world title. We've both only got the same stripe on our record. And uh, I want to test myself. I want to see how good Jack Catterall is. And I want to fight. Uh, we fought Josh when he was probably rated as number one in the division. Uh, and, I mean, 
I think realistically, we're now under the same promotional banner. I don't see many roadblocks stopping that fight from happening. And and I get it. There's probably easier options to to try and get down the world title. Uh, Roddy Romero, I'm now probably rated in the WBA after picking up the international belt. Uh, I know he's scheduled to fight O'Hara, but uh, I, w- I want to be involved in some big fights, and uh, I feel like I deserve that. I feel like I. I dipped my toes in at that world level. I performed well, didn't get the decision, but uh, I'm ready to get straight back to it now and uh, see what big fights we can get involved in. And Jack, you've you've actually mentioned two fights I wanted to get your take on as well. Um, obviously, Josh Taylor boxes Tiafimo Lopez in about 10 days' time in New York. I wanted to get your take on that. And also, you mentioned it as well, Roly Romero against O'Hara Davies, your former foe. Um, yeah, if you can give me your opinion or prediction or take for those two fights, that would be, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm interested for the, for the Taylor-Lopez fight. Obviously, boxing Taylor last. I'll be keeping a close eye on that. Uh, very interesting matchup. We're talking about Lopez. It's his second fight now at 140. Uh, in my opinion, I didn't think he performed great, and he was very, very lucky to get the decision in his in his debut at 140. Uh, again, phenomenal fighter though for for what he's achieved uh, in the lead up to that last fight. And then uh, opposite to him, Taylor, who who only fought 15 months ago, who was extremely lucky to get the decision, uh, who since then has picked up numerous injuries. Uh, we had the fight scheduled twice. Uh, the fight's been pulled and quite serious injuries, really. And he seems like he's, from the outside, recovered quite quickly. But how well he has recovered, we're yet to see. Uh, quite an interesting matchup. And I wouldn't like to make a prediction, but... I wouldn't be surprised if Taylor ran through Lopez. Uh, Contrary to that, I wouldn't be surprised if Lopez uh, has had that time to grow into the weight and perform better than he did last time and caused Taylor a lot of problems. So I'll certainly be watching and I'll certainly be interested in in fighting one of the winners. Uh, Secondly, yeah, we've got Roller Romero, WBA champion. Uh, O'Hara's been ordered to fight him now. So interesting and... This might be an unpopular take, but I don't think uh, Rowley's going to fight O'Hara. Uh, I don't think there's an awful lot of interest in that fight. I know it's been ordered now. I'm not seeing anything from from Rowley's side. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if he vacated that belt and, and looked to fight somebody else. And we look at O'Hara possibly fighting for a vacant world title. And uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I, I can see that same scenario playing out, actually. And just before we wrap things up, Jack, um, I want to finish on a real nice positive note. I bet the gym is absolutely buzzing after Chantel's performance in Ireland. Wow, wow. Absolutely over the moon. You know what? It was uh, selfishly, it made our fight week that much better. Chantel uh, performed out of her skin, performed like we knew she could. Uh, she gone over there and done exactly what she needed to do. Uh, we've, we've, I've spent months and months in the gym with her uh, in the lead-up to that fight. We, we did think she was never going to get the, the Katie Taylor fight, and when Katie called for it, the fight was agreed and done within 24 hours, which was uh, which was quite a surprise. And, uh, yeah, she went over there, did exactly asked of her uh, from Jamie and Nigel. And once they arrived back home Sunday, uh, unfortunately I didn't make it to the fight, uh, fighting the week after, so I was at home taking care of what I needed to do but uh, once the team arrived back and we were straight into fight week for me and Akib it was uh, it was good vibrations all around she brought that energy back home with her and uh, kept us on the high throughout fight week excellent yeah she's again a friend of the show um, excellent to see her get the fight for one and also to win in the fashion she did it was it was unbelievable so over the moon and just before we wrap it up jack if you've got any closing words to the listeners like i say it's always great to to get some minutes with you and we haven't had you on for quite a while if you want to sign out with a little message my friend the floor's yours yeah i just want to show me gratitude for the for the great support they had saturday uh, there was a lot of people turn out to support me and uh I'm forever grateful for that and hopefully this time around i'm going to be kept active and we can hunt them world titles down and uh, get back to the top. And just that I appreciate everybody's support going forward. You deserve it, my friend. Listen, Jack, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Congrats once again on the win. Thanks for your time, and I hope you do get what's rightfully yours sooner rather than later. 
Thank you very much for your time. God bless. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. We're going to start here with this one. Diego Pacheco has signed a uh, well, a, a multi-fight promotional deal with Matchroom. He extends that contract there, um, and he'll be headlining on June. Sorry, not June, July the seventh in Mexico. Um, yeah, he'll be taking on Manuel Gale- Gallegos, I should say, in Monterrey, Friday, July 7th, live on the zone. Um, what else do we have? What else do we have? George Cambosos Jr. will be taking on the UK's Maxi Hughes. That's going to be going down on July 22nd. And in the co-main event, Keyshawn Davis steps in with former European champion Francesco Patera. So that's a, a decent night of boxing there shaping up to be July 22nd. And then, yeah, the final piece of news to mention. I'm going to come to you for this, Eddie, because um, I didn't come to you too much in part one. Um, but yeah, it's it's officially on. We're going to see the two best welterweights in the world battle it out. Errol Spence, Terence Crawford, July 29th. We're all going to be tuned in. Excellent. Finally. You know what I mean? It's, it's one of those things where it probably should have happened a good while ago. But, you know, better late than never. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, excellent fight. You know, uh I just, I, what I've always said about this fight in, in particular was that Earl Spence had a work rate. And it's not that he's throwing soft punches in there and just throwing a lot of them. He's throwing shots to hurt you from basically the first round to the 12th. And he's throwing them in bunches a lot of the time. Activity's high. His pressure's high. Um, it doesn't seem that he tires, you know, at any point. I have only seen him hurt kind of a little light buzz once, and that was when he had it, you know, kind of turned and looked away from um, Ugas. Or uh, Dennis Ugas. And I think any other, other than that, I've seen him hit by some other, you know, good punches, tough guys, special K. Kel Brook was in there with him and, and, and this, you know, and landed some shots on him, you know, some good clean counters, and, you know, just, you know, done doing what Kel Brook does, and he just kept coming kept coming and put, put, the, put the hands on him viciously. At and the one thing I think with uh, Terrence is that does he have that much more power than any of the guys that uh, Earl has faced? And enough to stem the tide of that that, that heavy wave of, of offense that he's going to bring in his way. And, you know, will he be able to let's just slow him down? You know what I mean? Make him, force him to sit back and watch uh, a few times or at least, you know, get, get his respect. And I think if Terrence Crawford can get it with respect, can, you know, maybe hurt him, maybe do some kind of damage to where it keeps him on his back foot a little more than we're ever used to seeing. Possibly then does he have a shot at winning. But in my opinion, Earl Spence's work rate and any guy that he's fought, who, and, and Danny Garcia was a, hell, was a, a hell of a puncher, and he did, I think, pretty well in, you know, considering against Earl, but he just couldn't compete with the work rate. And as tough and as strong as Danny was, he had to sit back and watch. And I just don't know if Terrence Crawford is going to be able to force Earl in a position like that. I just think, you know, he's, he's too busy. He's too strong. He's, 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 his motor's high. His work rate, obviously, is high. And, you know, he just he just he doesn't, like, he doesn't want to take a backward step. And it's really going to be difficult. It's difficult for me to, to see Terrence Crawford coming out winning. But... Hey, I've been wrong before. Um, this is what I see, but this, this doesn't mean that, that this is how it's going to go. So, looking forward to the fight. It's an excellent fight. Thank God it's finally here. It's what most people want to see. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about it closer to the time, Eddie. But just to get a prediction this far out, um, you're going with Spence. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to go with Spence. Um, I'm pretty sure if there's no late developing news about injuries or anything like that, which, you know, you take that for a grain of salt, you don't really know. You know, take that with a grain of salt, you don't really know how true these things are. Sometimes, you know, camps put it out in their own camps just to get people to kind of lay off a little bit or, you know, sit back a little bit. But the reality of it is I, I think everything, everyone full power, everybody, you know, ready 100%. I just think Earl's going to be a little too much for him. 
Well, there we go. It'd be interesting to see what you think closer to the fight. I'm going with Terence Crawford. I've always felt that Crawford um, would, would win that fight. If we ever did see it, we're going to see it. And it's fantastic that it's only, what, eight weeks away, so we don't have to wait too long for it. Um, yeah, that's it for the news. Moving on to the preview part of the show. Only two cards to mention. This one takes place later tonight at the Montreal Casino in Quebec, Canada over here. We're going to see Eric Bazinian. He's 29-0, and looking for win number 30. It's for the NABA Super Middleweight title and the NABF Super Middleweight title. Um, he gets in with Jose de Jesus Macias, who is 28-11 and with four draws. Only been stopped one time, though, in his 11 losses and that one was uh, back in 2017 um, since then he's been in with a couple of decent fighters Mikul Zuski, Salaman Sissoko Kerman Leharaga uh, Pavel Silja Jin none of them have stopped him so I'm expecting Eric Bazinian to probably win that one on points to be honest with you even though he can punch obviously last time out went the distance with Alontes Fox um Elsewhere on that card as well, I should mention one other fight. We're going to see Steve Claggett, who is 34-7 and with two draws, fighting for the vacant NABF super lightweight title against Alberto Machado, who's 23-3. and um, He can certainly punch, but also if you can beat him, you usually manage to knock him out. Been stopped in all three of his losses. And then, yeah, the final card goes down at the Little Caesars Arena in Detroit, Michigan, a homecoming for Clarissa Shields. It's going to be live on the zone. Clarissa defends all her middleweight world titles. She's 13 and 0 with two KOs. She steps in with Marichella Cornejo, who is 16 and 5. Um interesting thing here. Obviously, we know that Clarissa Shields was originally scheduled to take on Hannah Gabriels, who once upon a time they both fought and Gabriels knocked Clarissa down but ended up losing by unanimous decision over 10 rounds. Um, and yeah, Hannah Gabriels fouled a drugs test and in steps the late replacement, Cornejo, who, you know, probably isn't really as good as Hannah Gabriels. I think it's probably fair to say. And we're getting a bit of a late replacement here. But, you know, Cornejo is tough. Um, never been stopped in, in her five losses. They've all been on points. Um Twice to French on Cruz de Zern as well. She gave her a good fight, I think, in the first one. Um, and yeah, you know, she's 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 been in there with some decent fighters and the rest of it. Um, I would expect Clarissa to certainly win the fight, obviously. And I I am wondering if maybe I know it's a big, big, big shout, and it's probably not worth it for the odds because the odds are probably not great, but. I wouldn't be surprised if Clarissa actually got a stoppage here just because Cornejo hasn't had too much notice and the fact that she's only boxed once in the last year and, uh, well, the last 15 months, actually. She's only boxed once and the fight only went one round. She boxed a girl who was 0-1 and stopped her in the first round. So she's not been very active. She hasn't beaten anyone with a winning record for over four years. Um... She's 3-2 and two in her last five fights, but like I say, all three wins were to people with either losing records or drawing records. 2-2 two and two, uh, was one of the ladies. So I'm not expecting too much really from Cornejo. Also, the, the age as well. She's 36 years of age. Clarissa very much seems in her prime, you know, 28 years of age. So I'm expecting Clarissa to really look good in that fight. And I wouldn't be surprised if we did see a stoppage. But then it's probably still not worth the punt because, you know, um, it's, it's not going to be like risk reward factor. It's probably still not worth it unless you see a mad price. But all the best to Clarissa. Remember, if you haven't been listening to the podcast long, you can go onto YouTube and you can hear me sing a duet with Clarissa, which is... Um, which is when, yeah, back in the day, our interview took an interesting turn and we sang a song together. It's a true story. Look it up on YouTube. But anyway, that is it, though, for the preview part of the show. In part one, we did the review part. Then we welcomed our special guest, the uncrowned, super lightweight, undisputed world champion, Mr. Jack Catterall. And then, yeah, in part two, we did the news. We've just wrapped up the preview part. The final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. 
Okay, and this wraps up episode 398 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge shout out to this week's special guest, the former super lightweight world title challenger, Mr. Jack Catterall. The biggest thanks of all though goes out to you, the listeners. Thanks once again for tuning in. If you do have a spare minute, please leave us a review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to this podcast. That's about everything though from myself enjoy your weekends people stay safe and we shall see you all again next week